How's it going everyone? My name is Giovanni and welcome back to another video. I'm filming this part after we finished everything. Because remember in last week's video when I said after I pulled out the engine out of the avalanche that I would be working on it in a week? Well, it's about four weeks later now. And you know what guys? It's because life happens. And the one thing I stress out about when uh, people ask me like how they're gonna do something, try to get all your stuff in advance. I know it's gonna cost more money in the long run and you might not use everything you need. Try to get as much of your stuff in as you can. I thought I had gasket kits and stuff, but turns out I've been picking parts out of them for years now. And so I was missing a bunch of gaskets. I didn't have the right bearings. I didn't have a lot of things. When we tore into the engine, it was actually a lot worse than I thought. So I ended up having to need a crank and a few other things that you'll guys see in this video. But for you guys new to the channel, you know, I am just a regular guy like you guys. And you know, I show you guys everything because it's gonna happen to you. So without further ado, let's hop into the video and check out this engine. It's pretty bad. I think you'll enjoy some carnage. All right. so. Uh, we need to get the oil out of this engine. I've decided that this is what we're going to be doing now. We're going to be rebuilding this guy. So first things first, let's drain all the oil that we can. We're still probably going to make a mess, but oh well. I got a metal pan under here to catch most of everything. Got an oil pan. Basically, at this point, no matter what, both engines are out anyway. So it's easier to just rebuild this one than to change parts on the new engine. I don't really want to buy a new cam and all that for the new engine. So I'd rather just, ooh, there's water in this. Oh, well, that might be from me pressure washing it. Yeah, I had the exhaust open, so that's fine. Oh man, I just made a mess. We're gonna let that drain slowly because I just made a mess. Thank God I had that metal pan underneath. Altogether, this oil doesn't look that bad. I'm not seeing any metal particles yet, but you know, I'm sure we'll see some soon. I think what we're gonna do first is take off the heads. Once the heads are off, we'll check the, well, we'll take off the valve covers, check for valve train damage. After that, we'll probably pull the cam. And then at that point, we're pulling heads anyway, checking for any damage on the heads, valves, anything like that. And then finally, once everything is all apart, we'll probably flip it over and empty the oil pan or take off the oil pan and check underneath for any damage. Oh, there's definitely a lot of metal on my drain plug. I'll show you guys that now in a second. Okay, so let's see, not sure how well that's gonna focus or not, but definitely some oil chunks, I mean some metal flakes on our drain plug. You know, we'll look at this a little bit closer. I can definitely feel the flakes. So, not looking good. Like I said, it's probably going to be a rod bearing that gave just with the mileage of the engine and all that. I think that's what we're probably going to be looking at here. But yeah, there's some significant chunks. I'm not sure how well you guys are going to pick up on this, but those are all, you can see they're magnetic. So those are all, that's all metal. And that was just on the drain plug. So I'm sure that there's more on the bottom of the pan. So this is not looking great, guys. Not looking great, but hopefully it's just a rod bearing, not a main bearing or anything else, no cam bearings, because I can easily fix a rod bearing. Everything else is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so first thing we're checking here, notice how much play is on this. We're talking actual millimeters instead of thousandths of an inch on that one. So that could be a, a lot of the noise that we were hearing. This one's a little loose. That one's not as bad, that one's solid. And, and honestly, this all depends on what phase the engine is in right now. But that one, that seems like excessive play to me. The bolt's not loose, but I mean, that's excessive play, no matter what position the cam is in right now. This one, a little bit of play, no play there, a little bit of play, no play. And like I said, what matters most is on what position the cam is in right now. This valve is looks like it's all the way up, so this one is not bad. This one is pretty bad. All the push rods seem to be fine on this side. I'm not seeing any signs of any bent push rods. No excessive wear on any of the push rods either. So these are looking pretty good. 
I'm almost to the point where we're gonna roll out valve train issue and we're gonna start leaning towards uh, bottom end failure. All my push rods on this passenger side are looking great. So we'll move on to the driver side. These ones are also looking all straight and all good, so I'm gonna roll these ones out as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that a lifter couldn't have failed, but I don't think that's gonna be the case here. I guess now the only thing left to do would be to remove the heads. That's what we'll do. A lot of water is going to come out of this. I'm going to do this slowly. I'm going to save my head gasket as well. Oh, there we go. Okay, so everything's checking out here. There's no major damage to the heads or anything like that. I will say something though, this engine, so far now that I took the heads off, it smells kind of funky. Like, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of a musty smell. It smells like cussy. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. It smells like cussy. These heads smell like cussy. Yeah, so anyway, heads are fine. As you can see, pistons are looking great. Uh, oh, is that, is that a broken piston? That looks like a broken piston right there. You guys see that? Hey, really quickly, I just wanna interrupt the video and just say, if you guys are new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button. You know, it helps me out a lot. It helps me make the content that I'd like to do. It helps me buy car parts for these ridiculous, insane projects that I'm always doing. Hit the subscribe button. If not, drop me a like. It uh, doesn't cost anything. It's 100% free, I promise. Except, yeah, and I'm seeing a little bit of scoring on the cylinders, but nothing terrible. So let's rotate the engine and see what that's all about right there. Okay, so now we're gonna turn this engine over and see what this piston's all about right here. All right, so this looks like it could be a broken piston. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure that's a cracked piston. So that's probably what went wrong here. Probably had some detonation and it split this piston right here along this uh, this line. So I think that's what our problem is. I don't see any other damage on anything else. So, worst case scenario is we're replacing a piston. I mean, obviously, if we're gonna replace this piston, we gotta remove everything anyway. I see no reason why we shouldn't do bearings, at least just rod bearings. We'll check all the other bearings, but metal's been run through this engine already, so no sense in you know, skimping on that kind of stuff. Let's go ahead and check these lifters out now. This lifter looks fine. These lifters were replaced when I did the DOD delete. So I have a feeling they're all gonna be okay. Maybe other than the one that's got a broken piston on it. But yeah, the lifters all look okay. Well, this side looks okay, which is promising. Okay, now here's the one with the broken piston. Let's see how this one's doing. Perfect, actually, nothing wrong with it. I only did the DOD delete maybe, let's call it 20, 15. We'll say 15,000 miles. I don't remember at what mileage I did the DOD delete, but it wasn't too long ago and I don't drive this truck as often anymore. So this lifter definitely feels like it's stuck in there. That one definitely feels a lot worse than the other ones, but again, just a light score mark. We'll see how the cam looks, but this one's not looking terrible. So if anything, there would be a complete loss or a drastic loss of compression in this cylinder because of this crack right here, right down the bottom of the piston, all the air is gonna be blowing right past that. Also, I noticed, and I don't know if I got that on film or not, but I did notice a lot of oil inside the intake. That could be another reason because basically when the intake valve opens, it's creating like this vacuum effect. And if oil leaks past this part, then that's all going into the intake, out the exhaust, white smoke. I think I did notice that. So that's probably the majority of my issues right there. The reason why I did that is probably because I'm a bad tuner. 
If you guys remember, we used that BTR cam on the DOD delete. And I honestly, I, I stopped recommending that cam. I took it off of that video because this is, it might be rumor, it might be true or not, but I think BTR ended up withdrawing that cam from their lineup basically. They no longer sell that particular cam. And I think this could be reason why. I noticed like I couldn't get proper vacuum no matter how much I tuned the truck or whatever, I couldn't get good vacuum. I think this might be a collapse lifter also. So that might be an issue there. So possibly one damage lifter on this side as well. So maybe we we're out two holes. We won't know till we find out, right? Anyway though, back to what I was saying, BTR had that one cam. I don't think it was a good cam. I don't know what was wrong with it, whatever. I couldn't get a good vacuum signal. Like my brake booster always felt low. And then I had a rough, hard time just getting it to like idle correctly. And like I said, I'm a shitty tuner, but normally I can at least make them idle and like run reasonably. This one just never really wanted to run right. So, you know, it could be other factors as well. But the reason that this piston broke, I'm not gonna blame on that BTR cam. I'm gonna say that most likely that was because I'm a bad tuner and I probably had too much ignition timing at the wrong point and that's what happens. You get detonation, which is basically pistons coming up on its way down and then the spark plug ignites, slaps the top of this piston with all that force and then that's how you lose rods, etc. So unfortunate. Luckily though, like I said, there's not a lot of grooving or pitting on that cylinder at all really. I think that we'll be able to just scuff up that cylinder with a light hone and probably send her. I mean, that's about as much as I want to do anyway. I don't know how much of this you guys will be able to tell or see, but it's you can just tell there's like a, a groove like this, about two finger width wide. And now that I move that piston, you could really tell the difference on the bottom there. That thing's definitely cracked open. So as soon as we pull that piston out, it's just going to crumble basically on that side, I think. And we'll have a nice little chunk of piston as a memento. Not much else left to do other than flip it over. Probably pull the timing cover and start pulling rods and stuff. Uh, we're gonna pull that cam out anyway because we're gonna replace it. At least now I know I need at least one piston, one lifter, and... Oh, well we didn't check this side, so let's check this side. We play a little game with Allie here. Come to this side, Allie. Let's see if Allie could figure out what's wrong with this engine. I'll give you a hint. It's on this side of the engine. Mm -hmm. Okay, all you have to do is examine... That one. Mm-hmm. inside the oil pan. I'll show you guys that in a second. Metal all up in our screen. This is looking pretty bad so far. Let's get the windage tray off, pick up tube off, and we'll keep going.
So word on the street is if you don't make any eye contact with your cam bearings, they won't fall out. So hopefully that's what happens. Okay, so actually surprisingly the camshaft doesn't look that bad. I mean there's a little bit of wear in some certain areas like right there and towards the back, a little bit of metal shavings. I honestly think my cam bearings are probably toast just by looking at this front one, but I don't have the cam bearing install tool so I guess now it's time to buy one. Um, we're not gonna be reusing this cam anyway. I just wanted to see if there was any premature wear, which there was a little tiny bit, but this is that BTR cam. They discontinued this. If you find one of these, I don't recommend getting one. I'm not gonna say it's the cause of everything, but eh, it's not even labeled, so who knows? It just wasn't a very good cam. But now, I think it's time to start taking off the rod caps. Go bleep bloop, beep bloop, bleep bloop, blah blah. What I'm gonna do first, before I even do that, is I'm gonna go get a punch, and I'm gonna punch top of the rod and the bottom of the rod on every single one. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That way when I take these apart, I don't get my rod caps mixed up and we'll know which way they go. So let's go get on that. Okay, so we went ahead and marked all those so we won't get confused when we take them apart and inevitably four weeks passes by and we forgot what rod caps go where. I guess now it's time to just unbolt all the rod caps, start pulling pistons at this point. You can actually hear like the, the knock. I don't know if you guys can, but just listen as I spin it. Hear that? So definitely have a rod knock going on. And the main reason why we do all this is because these rod caps are not smooth. They're a cracked rod cap. They look almost like it's one piece right now, but once we take them apart, there's gonna be a little cracked edge. If you try to put number two on number three or you know anywhere else, that seam is always gonna be a little bit off and you're always gonna have a problem. So keeping everything together the best we can, is just gonna save us a headache in the long run. There's piston number one. Let's check this bearing. They're not terrible, but you can tell that there's metal chunks in there. I'm inspecting this piston. The rings look fine. There's definitely chunks of stuff all over them. So far, not terrible, but we're gonna replace that anyway. Yeah, these things are not looking great. Oh, this one's gone. Number six must have been knocking up a storm too. Let me get you guys in on this one, hold on. This bearing's actually gone. Oh, no, they overlapped each other. So number six was a total destruction of the bearing. There's nothing left of that on the top part. So it was spinning around the crank, which means my crank isn't, oh man, my crank is worn down right there. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is getting harder and harder because I wanted to try to salvage some of this stuff, but as you can see, there is a literal step down on the crank, you'll see. See that? Probably no saving this crank. You're not gonna be able to add material right there and that's probably a good 50 thou gone, maybe even 100 thou gone, I don't know. It's a lot. That's a lot of material to lose on a crank. I'm probably gonna be looking for a used crank now, or a new crank, maybe. And honestly, the only reason we're even doing this is because this is a Gen 4 engine. If this was a Gen 3, I'd say, screw it, go to a junkyard, get one for 500 bucks. But Gen 4 engines, as you guys know, are a lot more expensive, and this one's worth saving because it's an aluminum block. Oh, and we're losing pieces of piston now. Piston is disintegrating in my hands. Oh yeah, we broke a ring land on this one as well. So this piston is destroyed. This might have actually been, let's see, what number is this? This is number six. So number six might have been the one that we that we knew was bad. So yeah, but piston is just falling apart in my hand. That's uh, not great. Number eight. The crank is fine in every other place but that one, that sucks. 
That's why as soon as you hear a knock, you don't you don't run your engine. This could have been salvageable, but I ran I had to run the engine like another 50 miles or so. And in that 50 miles, it basically obliterated this crank. So if you ever hear a knock, suspect a knock, anything, just turn your engine off, get a tow. I was stubborn and I wasn't gonna tow my vehicle, so that's what I get. Gonna just bring you guys in here. So again, this was our number six cylinder. These bearings are just toasted, gone, obliterated. And then our crank, you could just see from the side, there's an actual bevel, basically, where the uh, bearing was just grinding in there, rod was grinding in there. Pretty sure crank is gone. That rod is gonna need to be replaced. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm contemplating whether all these rods need to be replaced or not. Pretty sure our cylinders are fine. Cylinder six was even okay. We just need to hone it, and I'm gonna hone all these cylinders. We're trying to do this without any actual machine shop work, so. I can replace the crank standard size. As long as the rods and the bearings on the rods are still standard size, we don't need any machine work. Everything should be within tolerance. Next, after this, we're gonna have to pull the crank and check our main bearings. If our main bearings are screwed, as long as we can fit standard size main bearings in, we're good. If we have to get it line board, then this is basically a total loss at this point. Machine work is gonna be way too much on this. I'm gonna be out six, seven, eight months. I don't like machine shops. They will usually just take your work in, sit it in the corner for eight months, and then you complain enough and they'll finally give it back to you. So that's why I try to do everything without doing machine work. I, I wish I had the equipment to do it, but I don't. Looks like we're gonna be getting a crank. I can't do much more until I get that. The only thing left to do is pop these main caps off. We'll check the main bearings out and then we'll move on from there. All right, and because everything is already out, we might as well mark all the main caps. These are a lot harder to mess up than the uh, rod caps, but. Now let's pull some main caps. These are 15s, I believe, and they are torqued like a mofo, I'm pretty sure, so. We'll get Big Poppy. Ow! Amazing what a full battery will do. All right guys, so that's our crank. Overall, the bearings, there's some scoring on them. We'll probably change them anyway, but this crank is toast. There's no way that we're gonna be able to get around that massive, that massive cut in the bearing surface here on number six. So I'm gonna look up the part number of this crank, get a new one, and hopefully we'll be able to get by with just standard size bearings on everything else. I'll obviously hose off the, the inside of the block to get all that metal out and all that. Other than that, I mean, let's hope that we can we can fix this. I know for sure we can't fix this, but we might be able to fix everything else. And yeah, so just so you guys can see, those are our bearing surfaces. So I'll get back to you guys when I get a new crank. This thing's looking good. Uh, you can tell they cleaned it up a little bit. It's not stained black like mine is. Oh man, these things are, this is not 29 pounds. <laughs> I will go grab a 40 pound weight and compare it to this. Oh, whoever this company is, straight up lie. Okay, try not to damage anything, but also trying to squeeze through this tight space. That thing's smooth as hell and without even the main caps on. So I think we're good. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that we're fine. I'll go ahead and get the main caps on here and crank them down a little bit. 
but I think we're okay. Obviously, I'm not a professional engine builder, and you shouldn't be watching this channel if you think I'm a professional engine builder, because I'm not. But I have eyes, and I have hands and stuff, and I could feel that these bearings are not as bad as I once thought they were. I will for sure be changing the raw bearings, because those are not good. I also didn't buy any plastic gauge, which was a mistake on my part. As long as we spin this thing over really, and it's not knocking on the stand here, I have a good feeling about it. Anything really is better than what we had. And if this engine gets another 100,000 out of it, then you know what, it did its job. If someone buys this, just know that you're buying a $220,000 vehicle and this is probably better than the current state it was in. So I'm not here to rip anyone off. I'm just here to do what I can. Ow. Don't do that. Just smash my finger. These use a torque sequence. We're gonna do the bolts first. Start here and then kind of work our way out in like a pattern. We're gonna torque those down to about 18 foot pounds. And then these guys, same thing, boop, 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 boop. Those are gonna be about the same, about 18, 20 foot pounds. And then after that, we're gonna go ahead and torque the middle ones again. We need to get the thrust set, which this one is already basically zero thrust and it's not even in there yet. We're gonna pry forward on the crank, pull forward towards towards me on the crank while we torque this number three cap down. Again, not an engine builder, just slapping shit together in my garage. So that should work to set our thrust bearing and then, you know, do the same thing on all the other bolts and then pop those side puppies in. Not rocket science, just uh, engine building. Engine building. All right, well, it's been about an hour looking for my torque wrench. No idea where it is. Either way, I just figured it's time to upgrade anyway. So I went to Harbor Freight and I got this Quinn electronic one. So the way that these bolts work, they're torque to yield, like most engine bolts on GM vehicles. The head bolts are gonna be similar to this. But basically what that means is that they don't use a set torque foot pound. They use a first initial set and then they use a angled set basically. These guys, I think it's about 18 foot pounds for all these and then another 80 degrees, which this torque wrench actually will do. It has an angle mode, so that's pretty neat. I was reading and it seems to be about 62 pounds. Seems to be the foot pound average for this. So if you guys are at home and don't have a fancy torque wrench like this, you can go ahead and I would just snug them all down to about 20 foot pounds first round and then go around and I would do like a 45 on all of them and then I'd snug them up to about 60, 62 foot pounds. Actually, I found this tool in a box of my dad's old tools that he had in my grandpa's shed. And I always thought these were really cool. You always see all the, uh, you know, the engine builder dudes on TV have these, but it does, it does actually make things go faster. It's a little wobbly. That's just to get them snug. And then we'll start in the middle and work our way out. So this is probably a late 80s tool that I have here. No idea what it is actually, let's take a look. It does say Par X US 40 USA. So whatever a Par X is, probably doesn't exist anymore, but that's what this tool is. So it's kind of an old vintage thing. Thought it was pretty neat. I found a whole bunch of like old Matco sockets and stuff in there, just nostalgic. What are we gonna set it to? 18 foot pounds first. Okay, and then one more thing before I torque this down all the way, I'm gonna grab this pry bar and just, we're not trying to kill it. We're just trying to put a little bit of tension on the crank, maybe even right here. Just basically anywhere that we can put a little bit of tension out on the crank as we do this to set the thrust. Okay, that's 18. We're gonna do the two middle ones. Okay. 18 foot pounds with the thrust bearing set. That's still feeling really good. And then you just work out from the middle basically. So like this one. And then we're not gonna worry about the sides yet. Those don't factor in. So now that we've torqued these to 18 foot pounds, we're gonna add 80 degrees. So we're at 31, 40, 50. Oh, 60, and it says, I think, the newton meters that we're at, 65, 75 newton meters. Okay, so 61, all good. 
70, 70, 75, 76, 80. Okay, yeah, that's pretty neat. I've honestly never had one of these, and that makes life pretty easy on these tortillas. I'm always guessing on the foot pounds and stuff. You could also buy like the little degree wheels that you put on top of your torque wrench, but those are dumb. This is way cooler. 80. Okay. 16 pounds and then 53 degrees. Oh god, 16 is nothing. That's foot pounds, right? Yeah. I would have 16 foot pounds. Whatever you say, internet man. Okay, now we go back to our angoli mode and these ones are gonna go to 80. No, 53, right? Isn't it? 53, which is nothing. 40, 6, 53. Ugh, yeah, 53. 53. 53. 53. Okay. So these should be torqued. And this crank, yeah, this crank is feeling nice compared to what we had before. Side bolts are 18 foot-pounds total, all in. Okay, so now that this is flipped over, the only thing I really want to do here is just give these cylinders a light hone and then we have to swap our piston over to the other rod. That should be no big deal. Give these a light little hone and send them home. You can see there's a little bit of a scratch in the cylinder. There you go. With these stones, it's really hard to get a cross hatch going. I'm gonna try my best, but usually I'm not able to get like a nice cross hatch. You have to use the dingle ball hones for those. But usually just going up and down, in and out fast. Try not to hit the crank. I don't know how well you guys are able to see, but that's, that's decent, it's good enough. So I'm just gonna do all the rest of them just like that. It's gonna go pretty quick here. I'm gonna call that good. Good enough at least. I'm gonna put new rings on all the pistons. So we're gonna re-ring all the pistons, set the gap to the stock gap, which is, I don't know. And then we also have to replace our bad piston on the press with our new piston. So we're gonna get that done first and then we'll re-ring everything. All right, so for this part, I didn't realize I had it on time-lapse mode. So turns out Gen 4 pistons are pretty easy to take apart. I just use a little hook pick to take out the snap ring. Then you find a socket that fits in there pretty loosely, hammer out the pin, and uh, repeat the process in reverse. Okay, a little bit of a change of plans. I'm thinking that I might just send things the way they are. The rings, obviously I'll replace the new piston with new rings. I'm looking at the gap on these and these are looking pretty good, honestly. Let's try like a 22. 22, bigger than 22 and that's fine. 23, 24. Yeah, it's bigger than 24. Yeah, so it's probably a 26. 26 is perfect for me. So yeah, I'm just gonna run all the rings too. No sense in changing those if we don't have to. All of these are good. I'm gonna just visually inspect all of them. Yeah, that's the top ring on cylinder number one and it's perfect, so.
what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and torque all of our rod caps, rod cap bolts, and those we're gonna do 15 foot pounds and 85 degrees. Last one. And then we'll spin the engine over again a few times just to make sure that we're, I think we're good. two different cam sprockets to show you guys. I wanna just go over each of them really quickly. So the cam that we had in here was not a stock cam and it was actually a three bolt cam. The important thing to know is on the fourth gen LS engines, your cam sensor is in the front timing cover. Your cam sprocket actually has the phasing. So you can see here, this is a 4X cam sprocket. Whereas on a gen 3 the phasing would have actually been on the back So if you guys are looking at cams on a gen 4 engine and you're trying to figure out which one the original is a one bolt cam and It's really hard to find some performance cams or some some particular cams that come in a one bolt pattern So what you could do is you can actually get one of these and I hope you guys can see that part number there I'm gonna try to get up close for you guys one two five eight six four eight one and if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is off of a Pontiac G8. I don't remember exactly. If you look up the part number, you'll find out what it was for. It's a very common item in regards to LS stuff. But this basically allows you to use a three bolt cam and keep your cam sensor in the front. So this is a, a really nice little tidbit of knowledge here to drop on you guys. This will allow you guys to use three bolt cam. And then this would be like the OEM one. I don't think this is the actual OEM one, but I went ahead and bought another one because I wasn't going to look through boxes and boxes to find mine. But yeah, this is the uh, 125-91689 cam. Other than that, the rest of this is probably just gonna be time-lapse because who wants to sit here and watch me stick a rod in a hole for 30 minutes? You can uh, catch that on my OnlyFans if you want to. Anyway, let's go ahead and keep on carrying on. But when you're doing this, the most important part of all this is basically getting it what we call dot to dot. So that means that this little mark right here, on some phasers there's a dot, other ones there's a line. And then, I don't know how well you could see it, but there's a dot on our crank sprocket. As long as you can draw a straight line from this dot to this dot, you're, you're gonna be good. That's zero timing for the cam. With that all in mind, we're okay here. Our timing chain is on, our cam is on. The way you would do this is just lift up the cam and turn it a tooth until you get those marks lined up. Obviously you're gonna turn your crank first to line it up here and then just pick up the cam sprocket and keep turning it a tooth at a time until you get it pretty much exactly like that. I'm gonna just look at the other cam sprocket and verify against this to make sure that this is right, that the marks aren't different or anything. But other than that, we should be good. All right guys, so again, we're gonna have to stop because I need an oil pan gasket. I looked all over the shop, I do not have one, and I just don't feel comfortable putting this thing back together with this one. Don't know exactly what happened or if this has been serviced before. There, there seems to be some kind of like gasket sealer or something, but as you can see in some parts, it's actually raised up above the gasket surface. So I'd rather just peel that one off and grab a new one. So I will order one, hopefully have it in two days, then we'll throw this back on and then really, it's all smooth sailing from there. We'll throw the oil pan gasket on, flip the engine over, put the heads on, timing cover, all that stuff.
All right, so we got the oil pan all assembled. We just need to put our front timing cover on. I'm gonna just verify the torque specs on these. Be very careful when you're doing the rear ones. They are in inch pounds. Honestly, just snug them up as tight as you can without breaking them because those tend to snap easily. All the other oil pan bolts should be 18 foot pounds. That's it for those. We still need to torque down our rear cover. After we get the engine on the hoist, we'll do that. I left them all like sticking out of there so I would know. Hopefully, I'll remember. I think we already went over this, but as we're putting the lifters in, I remembered one of them was broken. So I bought a brand new lifter. Here's a new Malling lifter right out of the box. You shake it, you might hear a little bit of like a <laughs> kind of sound, but it should not sound like this. This is a bad lifter. So that's a bad lifter right there. Good lifter, bad lifter, good lifter. You'll hear like a little clicking and that's actually just parts in there just kind of barely touching. But this, it's not gonna have any pressure and you can actually see right here, it's collapsed. So that part right there, you shouldn't be able to do that with the new lifter. Just wanted to point that out really quickly just in case you guys are doing this. Double check your lifters, just shake them as you pull them out. You'll know which ones are bad and which ones are good right away. But any hoot, let's continue assembling this. Many of you aren't gonna like this, but I'm reusing my head bolts. And what I'm aiming for is 55 foot pounds first, first pass. And then when I come back, I'm gonna bring it up to like 60 foot pounds, go again. I'm trying to get to like 64, 65 foot pounds. If it starts resisting at all, you just stop, okay? Obviously, if you guys are gonna use new head bolts, then use factory torque specs, which I don't have on hand right now, but it, you have to use an angle gauge. and. As you guys saw there, I did reuse my head gaskets because these were new. We did all this only 20,000 miles ago, so. All right, we're getting up to 50 foot pounds. Okay, so we're at 55 right there. So now that these are at 55, we can bring it up to 60. And like I said, if they, they just feel off, just stop. The last thing you wanna do is snap a head bolt after you've gone this far, so. 60, and as soon as I hear that beeper, become solid, that's when I'm gonna stop. I'm not gonna try to do anything more than that. Yeah, see, so that one, that's it. That doesn't wanna go anymore. No one's already at 60. No one's there, see? So there's really not much of a difference. After you've gone to 55, you went over a little bit probably. You're probably more at 58. It takes, you know, a little touch to get to 60. 60 is good enough for me. Let's do the other side and then we'll do these little 10 millimeter ones. These little guys are 22 foot pounds. So we're done with that. Last thing to do is the rockers and then I'll put this little steam valve on there.
And that's about it for now. We completely went through the engine. Everything's working well now. It's spinning really well. I'll make another video, uh, probably a short video on just doing the thread repair on the valve cover because I'm not gonna wait around for more parts on that. So it'll be another week or so before that gets finished. And then I will make another video when we actually drop the engine back into the avalanche. Hopefully it runs, hopefully it's all good to go. You know, the thing is when you're doing stuff like this, you gotta take risks. You gotta kind of calculate your risks. One of the risks I took on this was not doing the cam bearings. I deemed them fine. I felt them. There was no grooves, no pinning, no anything, just a little bit of wear on the actual surface coating. That's totally acceptable to me. Other people, that's not acceptable. And so you gotta really, you know, play it by ear if you guys are doing this at home as well. I was not gonna change the rear main seals and the front main seals, but then I ordered a kit because it was cheaper to buy the whole kit than just the oil pan gasket. So stuff like that happens and you just gotta adapt and, and adjust to it. If this were to be an all out engine build, it would have cost a lot of money. I would have had to send it to the machine shop, but you guys could see that even an engine that's knocking pretty badly like mine was, you can fix at home by yourself without needing a machine shop. Obviously the right way to go is to always get your engine, you know, magna flux and everything to check for cracks but we run what we brung here and that's what we have to do. So once again, I wanna thank you guys for watching the video. If you guys are new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. We're at 21,000 people now. I never would've thought in a thousand years that we'd be at this much, but you know, the community's growing. We're having a good time. We're doing lots of stuff. Yeah, also, if you guys have any questions, you wanna reach out to me, hit me up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Giovanni Dante. You can always message me on Instagram, instagram.com slash Giovanni Dante. My DMs are open. You can check out my website, GiovanniDanteGrego.com. I got a blog there, lots of interesting articles, lots of cool stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one where hopefully we're gonna be done with the avalanche for a few weeks and I got an exciting project coming up for you guys. I'll see you guys in the next one.